Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Kate Brown, and tonight we have Pamela Cameron with us, the author of Sport, Ship Dog of the Great Lakes. Um, this is a book that she learned the story of sport while researching becoming a volunteer lighthouse keeper. Is that right? Pamela? It is, Kate. It is. And did I call you Pamela or Patricia? I'm uh, sorry. If I... Yeah, Pam Pamela is good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all, right. all right. So we're very happy to have you and, and to learn the story of this beautiful dog and hear all about how you decided to create this gorgeous picture story. Take it away. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for the invitation to come to the Clinton McComb Library. I, um, We'll give you just a background of the book, and then I'd like to share quite a few slides, but I think each one adds a bit of understanding to sports story. Here's the actual book, and then you can see it's a children's picture book, but what's been amazing for me is that all ages have enjoyed the book. I think because there's enough history involved with it and enough backstory that I can t tell today um, that it makes it pretty interesting for all ages. And for sure, it's a way for uh, folks to think about the Great Lakes states. Uh, it all started with me finding a small article about sport. And in that article, there was this statement written by Captain Maynard, where he said, uh, sport was just a dog, but he was always a good dog and a good shipmate, a friend to everybody and everybody's friend. Well, he wrote that, Captain Maynard wrote it in 1926, right after Sport had passed away, after having spent 12 years on the ship that Captain Maynard was the captain of for many of those years. So that was enough for me to think that Sport should not be forgotten. So I started researching and this is what I found. Let's see here, Kate, well, Here we go. Started finding some photographs. And this one really got me interested because I it was easy to realize that two crewmen of the ship that Sport lived on had taken the time to have his photo taken and kind of having fun here with putting the life preserver on. And this also was a neat way to see the actual ship, which of course is no longer exists, but it's fun to see that, that wooden deck and the pilot house is in the back and the stack. And I'm not a maritime, was not a maritime person. So I, I told Kate a few minutes ago that this is an example of someone who learned as she went along as she wrote the book. So I hope perhaps that's an inspiration to anyone that has some knowledge on a topic or wants to investigate something. So here's a photograph that was one of the starting points. And before I go on too much, I'd like to uh, recognize the re illustrator, Renee Grafe, and she's on the left on the photo. And there we are at a Chicago bookstore. And I'll connect her with a lot of the research that I did because she used the photographs and research that I found to make uh, the illustrations historically accurate. And I also like to recognize the press, uh, Wisconsin Historical Society Press, I'm pretty open on this. Um, as a person who had never published a book before, I uh, knew it was going to be hard to get it published. And I submitted it for the, for the first time to Wayne State. I haven't talked to them since the book was published, but I was um, and did not expect them to accept it. And they didn't. They, every publisher has different things they need to look for and have an interest in. But the Wisconsin Press did. And that was OK, because the, the boat um, that sport was on was on Lake Michigan. So. We share Lake Michigan with Wisconsin. So it's a um, recognition of how presses are, take a chance on a book. I wasn't unknown to them. I was not an expert. I do not have a advanced degree in history. So that it's an example that anyone can try to get a book published. Then the era of sport was from 1914 to 1926. These are fun photos that I showed up kids. I just showed them to kindergartners this morning. And it was a, a way for them to think back 100 years ago. It's e easier for us to think about the changes from a horse-drawn carriage to an automobile. So that was the era. And here is one of the first illustrations in the book. Captain Maynard had written that 
sport was rescued from the Milwaukee River, which feeds into Lake Michigan. So I ima we imagine that scene, how it could have happened. And in the background, you can see the hyacinth, and that's the ship that Sport lived on and that rescued him. So Rene did a beautiful job here with historically accurate buildings and the ship. And that meant looking at maps, look, trying to figure out the waterfront in Milwaukee. And on the right, you can see Lake Michigan. And then uh, the Milwaukee coming in. And I, oh, the, there's another river there that has, oh, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> we'll pretend <laughs> that I, that we're not in Wisconsin and I should know that. Okay. All right. And then we, I imagined that this could have happened. And that's the part of the historical fiction that um, based on fact that I, I had to make up uh, that Albert and Clifford, I had Albert and Clifford's names, but I did not know how they did it. There was no mention that they dove in the water, but I imagined that they, they took a small boat off their, their large boat, the Hyacinth. And um, in the books, it states that without their captain's permission, they just got that small boat down and rescued sport. So there's a nice scene of, of those two crewmen. Now, the actual ship was built in Port Huron and there it is. And the background here is the Milwaukee Depot Ninth, the Ninth District, which then became the 12th. And it was built in 1903 by the Jenks Shipbuilding Company. And they built a number of other ships as were built all, all around the Great Lakes. A lot of shipbuilding in, uh, in, the air, in the Great Lakes area. And there it is at about 160 feet. Now, what it was was a, a lighthouse um, tender, which meant that it went out and took all the supplies to lighthouses. And it also took care of the buoys. And there were also light ships out on, on Lake Michigan and Huron, Superior. And those light ships were like temporary buoys, but they were a ship. So they were definitely isolated, as were many of the lighthouses. So the, the tender allowed those lighthouses to be lit because a tender would have brought all the fuel, food for the families or keepers, whoever was at a lighthouse. They would have brought the payroll, although I'm not sure how they spent it if they were isolated. They brought um, mail. They, the inspectors came on the light ship. Often you go to a lighthouse and they'll say, oh, the inspector came and the lighthouse had to be ship shape. Well, this is how the inspector came was on a, a lighthouse tender. They were recognizable because they had that white superstructure, the cabin area, the pilot's house, and then they had a black hull. And that was just a known out on, on the lake. And also these tenders were also on the Atlantic, the Pacific, and also on the Mississippi. So there, there's the ship built in Port Huron. Here's another image of it. And these uh, images, again, helped Rene do uh, accurate drawings. And then you can see there's some of the smaller boats on top. They would have um, used those to haul supplies into a lighthouse where they, the large hyacinth couldn't go in. Sometimes lighthouses had long docks out so the hyacinth could get closer, but often they had to uh, bring supplies in on smaller boats. And there they are. They also, Hyacinth would have brought a little boats out for the light keeper. The light keeper would have needed some small boats. So they delivered all these things, coal, all the fuel for the lighthouse would have come out on a tender. And for fun, the lighthouse service that managed these ships always affixed a brass lighthouse figure. And you can see it there. I, I probably should do a math figuring out the how high that is, but I'm guessing that's probably three, four, five feet in height. I, I've always thought, where are those? The ships are gone, but somebody has those, might have those brass, beautiful lighthouses as mementos. So there's the ship in uh, dry dock. You get a sense of the hull and the, the strength or the size of that boat. And here are two photos that also helped us with the rigging and the officers' uniforms. Can you hear me okay too, Kate? 
Yeah, good, okay, good. And that allowed Renee to do a drawing like this. She um, did her artistic magic and gave us this view of the crew on the ship and their sport on the, the deck. And uh, I think that's a neat way to see the ship. This is the only interior shot that I could find of the ship. We don't have any drawings in the book of the interior, but this helped me give it a, a feeling of the ship and the size of this desk, kind of a miniature desk, uh, a lamp on the side would probably have a little bit of a swing to it to allow for the motion of the ship. And again, that desk is um, being used by an officer on the ship. This is, was an important part of the book. We wanted to um, identify some parts of the ship and the kids like that a lot and uh, gives you an idea of the, the well deck right here was something new for me, but that's allowed uh, buoys. Buoys would have been put in through here. Also down here would have been lots of storage for coal. And the crew would have slept uh, below deck and officers up on that white superstructure. Now, I mentioned that the ship was the hyacinth that rescued sport. Well, what I loved finding out was that these tenders, workhorses, dirty, they were engineering um, tenders, they called so much dirty stuff, were often given botanical names. And I start here with a few as an example. The iris was in 1865, and they must have needed to make a new or build a new one, and they re reused that name iris. But there, there is just a handful, but there are dozens and dozens of them with uh, geranium, goldenrod, larch and willow, cherry and maple. I, um, I didn't identify where these were located, but for fun knowing that you're closer to um, Lake Huron that, than I am here, I'm closer to Lake Michigan. The couple that I found for Huron were the clover, the marigold, and the tamarack. I mean, you can't get much better than those beautiful names. Also, um, I've included that phrase flower pot fleet. During the Civil War, uh, several of these boats were used to help during the Civil War, probably on, you know, off the Atlantic, Atlantic coast. And they were called the Flower Pot Fleet. So just a fun historical fact. Here are a few photos that I was able to find showing the loading of that coal. And this was in Racine, Wisconsin. You can see the men on the left have bags of, of coal. And then those coal bags are being lifted onto the, to the ship. I'm not sure, actually they're probably, yeah, they're loading them onto the lighthouse, I think. It's hard, I should look closer there, it's hard to see. But anyway, the coal is either being lifted on, I think it's lifted on or off um, the hyacinth to get on to a lighthouse. So you can see very dirty work. But that coal, of course, was used to light, keep the lighthouse warm, not so much to, uh, not for the light, the actual light fuel, but it was needed to keep the lighthouse warm. And uh, this is an example of a log book. And it's an example that not every, everything is digitized. This is um, one that I saw at the National Archives quarterly. And this would have been up in the uh, pilot house where they kept track of what was happening every day. And I searched through those entries for a number of years, all the years that sport was on there. And if anything, I, it was a lesson in what they were hauling, what the weather was, uh, where they went. Nothing very dramatic would happen. And that was okay. That was all right. It just um, gave the, the four um, watches and entries. And at the bottom, Captain Maynard has, has uh, taken the 6 p.m. Well, no, Carlson took the 6 to midnight. But... Captain Maynard signed off as master slash captain. Okay. They laying in at Marinette for the night. So they were up in Marinette, um, uh, Wisconsin, right across the border from Michigan. So that was just fun to get the whole day-to-day -day workings. And then also allowed me to see the type of crew that was on the ship. And there were about 
a crew of about 25. And these are the types of jobs they had. And of course, the radio operator would have not been in the early teens, but started in the 20s, 1920s, when they, the ships would have gotten radio communication. Here's an example that helped Renee with the uniforms or their, their um, work, work, work gear, kind of like overalls. And that allowed her to do a, a drawing like this with sport. For fun, I, she put it in the back, you can see she's, she has a, a crewman with, a, um, oh, <laughs> um, squeeze box. <laughs> So that's kind of fun, having some entertainment on ship. Now back to sport. Here's another photograph I had. And I'm guessing this is a cook on board the ship. And I am not a dog expert, nor did I want to be. So I took this uh, photograph along with others to uh, veterinarians in the, the United Kennel Club, which is right here in Kalamazoo. And they identified sport as part Newfoundland and part retriever. So those were two breeds then that I researched. Sometimes I'm asked, oh, do you have a Newfie or a retriever? And I say, no, but if, if I wanted a big dog, I would. <laughs> They're very nice dogs. And that research for the dogs allowed me to write this scene where they've taken sport on board and they're wondering, well, the dog has been in the water, but the dog's not shivering. Well, Newfies have a double coat, so that makes them a, a good water dog, a good ship dog, because they, they have that double coat that keeps them extra warm and dry. And another characteristic of Newfies are their webbed paws. Now, I believe there are other dogs with a webbed paw, and you actually look at dog paws and they do have a bit of webbing, but they uh, have for sure have them for the, the need for swimming. So they've um, kept that or evolved to have a web paw for a nice strong stroke. They also use their tail, their strong tail um, for uh, as a rudder. So that makes them a great uh, water dog. So they're, they're just trying to figure out, will this be a good ship dog? and they decide he will be. So they take him on. Oh, a couple of slides here. I needed to be around Newfie. So here I am at a Newfie training session. Back behind me where I'm taking the picture, there are several more, oh, several dozen Newfies just standing there being quiet, waiting their turn. And uh, what I found out often Newfie owners have two Newfies. They just can't have one. Just a very um, nice, gentle dog. I needed to see how they moved. So this is an outside dog dog um, trial or dog, that um, yeah, was a dog trial where the uh, woman in the water has called to the, the dog in the small boat and that dog has made a gigantic leap from that boat on the, on the side. It's hard to see, I, but he just came, he or she just came out of that small boat with a bigger leap. And she's, she's doing her hand signaling. So sort of a rescue training. And uh, that allowed this scene to be um, imagined where um, we've got Sport jumping out of a small boat because he's he wanted to be there in the, with the action. And what's happened here is a tool bag was dropped in the water. So I use that retriever characteristic knowing he, he saw something belong to his crew and he dove in and and um, got it out. Again, I did not find any evidence that he had saved anyone. So I, I just couldn't put it in, in. And the publisher would have asked me, they would have said, is this true? And I know it would have been taken out if it hadn't been true. So um, we, need, we followed uh, the truthfulness of his story other than the <laughs> tool bag. And just an example of uh, Lake Michigan when, um, of course, I'm on the west side and you're on the east side. So I know we know Huron's over on your side and um, uh, the lighthouses. Uh, I've talked to the lighthouses and have um, communication with them about sports story. And I'll, I'll be getting to your area for programs in the future. And here's that photo again. 
And Captain Maynard said, no boat could go ashore without sport. So what did that mean to me? Well, I had to see it again. <laughs> I had to, this is uh, that same dog trial. This was early in the morning, in a September morning. And you can see uh, Newfie is pulling a boat in. Again, part of their training. And that allowed me to write this scene where I knew it was it had to happen because the hyacinth, as I said, couldn't always go in. Small boats had to go in. So the text uh, reads, sport carried the line to shore. Oh, I'm losing the words there, but he, then it could be used to pull the boat in. So I just used what I saw real Newfie do. And Captain Maynard said, no boat could go ashore. And I thought, okay, let's have him pull, pull that boat in. I also have photos, um, not in this slideshow, where uh, an example where they're training Newfies and they have like lots of weight in a boat and that Newfie's pulling a big boat in. So I know it's still being done. And uh, sports bringing this into a, a light and there's the lighthouse family. And what we did that we based this on a lighthouse in Wisconsin and that's how it looked in the 1920s. So Renee did a great job recreating that. And that's how it looks today. But now I'd like to focus on Michigan a little bit. This is uh, one of the largest lighthouses in uh, Lake Michigan. And you can see this as I did by going out on a boat from Mackinac City. So if anyone has that interest and in, I think they'll probably start them up they did, they might have done a few this year, but they'll they'll be in the future because because people love to get out on a ship. I think it's at Shepler's. And uh, you go out and see a lot of the, the offshore lighthouses. This one is being refurbished right now, and everybody's very happy about that. So if you can imagine, the hyacinth and sport would have come out to um, White Shoal and brought for sure that this light needed supplies. And Here's South Fox. This is an example of uh, a light that also needs constant maintenance. Um, someone I know was there as a volunteer and they mixed lime and water and stabilizer and they helped, they were starting to whitewash the lighthouse. They, and that's what the light keeper would have done through the, all the time they were there. When they weren't keeping the light on, they were constantly keeping their lighthouse spick and span and painted. This is Grand Traverse in Northport, and that's um, just north of, Grand, of Traverse City. And this is wonderfully restored. They do a beautiful job there. But I wanted to point out on the left is the fuel storage area. Of course, this is a, um, a light house with the light together. It's not separate. So that would have been a definite, uh, you wouldn't be storing the fuel in that house where you as the keeper lived. So they would store the fuel away from the building. And then on the right is their Foghorn building. And they've restored that very nicely. And just shows there's constant maintenance at the lighthouses that are open for visitors today. This was a great photo to find. There's sport. And when I found this, I did a little research and along finding out this whole baseball story. What was this all about? Well, these are crewmen from the ship. Captain Maynard and his wife did not have any children of their own. So they always considered the crew of the ship their, their boys, their kids. And that meant that Captain Maynard and his wife, she was part of the deal, um, they bought the uniforms for the crew. And the crew played baseball wherever they were, if they landed in you know, Mackinac City or wherever they were, they might play a local team or they might play a team from another ship. And this is important to me. And I think it's a recognition that baseball was just becoming America's pastime in the teens and the twenties. So that's, I like to think that sport was right there when baseball was becoming popular. And that meant I had to think what could have happened sport was out there playing baseball and I imagine that the other team was a little upset by that they didn't want a dog so that's the text for this page where 
they're saying, no, we don't want a dog on the, on the field, but the crowd in the stands want sport and they start chanting. So it's a, a recognition that sport was part of the team and he, he needed to be there for fun. Uh, this is just a page uh, where I re recognize the fog on the water and each foghorn and actually each lighthouse had a specific characteristic. So it wasn't just on off or different colors or there were different colors, but that meant that a ship out on the water would hear a foghorn, would see a light and they had an actual light list and they would probably had it memorized but they could always refer to their light list and know exactly where they were. Again, this for sure before radio communication. So this is sport uh, as a dog hearing through the fog. Here's an example of the light list. And they give all the coordinates where they are, how tall the lighthouse is. So anyone wanting to do uh, research on lighthouses likes to look at these light lists. And here's an example on the left of a buoy light, really nicely restored one. And then on the right, the Fresnel lens that would have been at the top of lighthouses. This one is at Ludington uh, Maritime Museum. Most lighthouses that you visit today, um, the Fresnel lens has been taken out either years, decades ago, and it's disappeared or Hopefully it's been saved somewhere and is in a museum because these are priceless. They're, um, the prisms often were um, broke or I think there is evidence where they were often just dismantled and never put back together. They were invented in France, I think 1830s, 1840s by Louis Fresnel. And they um, were a much better way to um, send out a light signal um, over miles and miles. So I think White Shoal was like 18 miles. So they, they varied in size. Um, and they were called orders. First order down, I think, to six. And here's a buoy, size of a big buoy. And this photo just happens to be Captain Maynard. They're probably adjusting the light. And uh, we incorporated a buoy in the book. It's an example of was more than just lighthouses. I knew I needed to have some food in the story when I found this weekly food allowance. And there it is, mutton, fresh and canned, codfish, evaporated apples and dried peaches. And they're all vinegar and um, pickles, mustard, baking powder. So these are the provisions that were given to light keepers and also on uh, the vessels. And the, how much, how many pounds of pork, beef, flour, brown sugar, coffee were given. But further reading, I found that a cook on a ship could go beyond this list. And the cook could ask the captain, the master, oh, we're in Traverse City. Can I go buy some? cherries. And that's what I imagined happened that uh, knowing all the fresh produce that's available in Michigan, no matter where you are in Michigan, where we are a farm state, when you think about it, we have lots of farms. So that little bit of thinking about fresh fruit and how fruit is important in Michigan made me write one sentence, but this is a, a nod to Michigan. The crew hustled to the mess where they found biscuits, stew, and fruit pies. Now I could have written any food there, but fruit pies, that's Michigan. Blueberry pie, peach pie, apple pie. So there's a cook that cook again with sport. The most dramatic thing I found, and this actually, when I think about it, was not in the, this was not in the log books. They didn't record this in the log books. Log books were all about deliveries and weather. But Captain Maynard had written down that sport had been lost in Chicago. Now they never said the date. So I, I could never, it didn't matter really 
It wasn't ever written up in a newspaper or anything, but Captain Maynard did write it down in the short, the short article he wrote about sport when sport died. So I'm glad he did. The most dramatic thing I could find. Sport was lost in Chicago. And of course, that would have been a bad place to get lost. But as we can imagine, every port, sport would have gotten off the boat. And that's how people got to know him. But he missed the captain's whistle, I imagined. Mm -hmm. And then we do know that somebody took him to just to be a watchdog or a warehouse uh, dog. And this has been a fun thing or an informational thing to talk to uh, children about. We talk about in those days, there were more strays. There weren't rescue societies. You could just kind of pick up a dog if you wanted one. And um, that explains, you know, no leashes, no microchips. So that explains that this man who just needed a dog put a little rope around sports neck. And uh, here he is in Chicago. And luckily within a couple days there, the man on the right was driving an ice wagon. I don't know his name. All we know is that he was driving an ice wagon and he recognized sport. And he knew that sport needed to get back to the Hyacinth. Now for fun, I like to show an ice wagon. And this one just happens to also carry coal. So again, it's an eye opener for kids. Um, I know our, my grandparents had ice refrigerators. We talk about how ice was delivered. So you had a refrigerator, you could keep your food cold and how the ice was cut from the lakes. And then the coal, the coal was delivered uh, during the winter. So it's almost like the, this company was <laughs> full season. They were pro delivering their ice in the summer and the coal in the winter. So that's, uh, I love that photo of the Oshkosh Ice and Coal Company. And uh, here's the scene where the ice man gets sport down to the dock in Chicago, but the hyacinth is gone, but the SS Indiana is there. And this is an example of one of the many passenger ships that were on Lake Michigan. Now, I'm sorry, I can't speak to Superior or Huron or the other lakes, the other two Great Lakes, Ontario and Erie, but I believe they also had this type of vacation passenger ship. Also, these ships would carry um, immigrants or folks that were, as an example, maybe they lived in Michigan and might have been a little bit before um, trains were starting, but it was e maybe an easy way to get over to Wisconsin to immigrate over to Wisconsin or get there. But they were, um, they developed into more of a passenger ship. And they also, um, we also had car ferries which carried train cars. And that's how a lot of uh, crops and produce or products got across from Michigan over to the West was via car, West and East was via car, train car ferries. But this one um, was, I think was basically a passenger ship, although it probably did carry some cargo. So there it is. And families were on, the, on these ships. Here's a postcard of it. Shows, you know, it was a tourist. <laughs> you probably took a trip on the, the SS Indiana and you bought a postcard and sent it home to your family. So here it is in postcard form. I actually have that postcard. And that was, I found that somewhere. And the Goodrich Transit Company out of Chicago owned that ship along with others. Now I'm going to do a sideline here too, because to me, these, um, these ships were just too, too interesting. It, this one, just Goodrich Company, just basically went up Lake Michigan. But as I said, the other lakes must have had other companies that ran cruise these ships. This one basically just went up to Mackinac. Okay, so then here's some photos of inside. You know, kind of reminds us of you know, how different parts, we always think of the Titanic, but this was the era of the Titanic, the luxury of passenger ships. This one's, of course, pretty modest, but if you were traveling from Chicago up to Mackinac, it would have meant you had to sleep overnight. So dining room and uh, some bed 
cabins. And this is just a fun map that the Goodrich company showed everybody. And this is where we go. And you can, um, of course, everyone's had their experience with um, the ports, whether you're on um, the east or west side of Michigan, but just, it shows the ports that they went to. And that allowed me to think of this scene. All I knew was sport went back on the SS Indiana and I needed to get children in the story. So I imagined that the children heard that their ship, the SS Indiana that they were traveling on had a dog on board and the word spread and the kids started asking, could they go down into the fast freight area? I imagine that's where they put sport and the kids all got, got to go down and here they are asking questions about sport and uh, they're hearing the book wraps up with the, the children hearing about sport played baseball he helped the crew he lived on the ship for 12 years he was rescued and and now the ss indiana is re he's rescuing him again as a puppy he was rescued he's rescued again so it's, it's a story of of rescue and uh, people helping and being part of a team. So there they are. And of course, there's a, a little girl with her sailor suit. And she's in front of the city of St. Joe ship. And the city of St. Joe, if you're familiar with St. Joe, it's just down at the bottom here of the lake. That um, town, not that far from Chicago, that was a nice uh, day trip. Folks from Chicago would get on this ship. Sometimes uh, companies or businesses would uh, charter the whole sh this whole ship and the whole company would go on the ship or families would just come over to St. Joe. Uh, if you haven't been to Wisconsin, I, I lived in Wisconsin for 20 years and now I live in Michigan. Wisconsin does not have the sandy beaches that we have in Michigan. So that was a draw to come over to Michigan where the, the sandy beaches were. Just a big, little vacation. And here's Sport back on his ship last page of the book. And I imagined that, who knows, if he, every night a different crewman took care of him or he was right next to a crewman every night. So there he is. Now back to some photographs. Uh, the Milwaukee Museum has a nice collection of his photographs and I'm able to use a few of them here. So I appreciate the, that museum. What happened in 1926 sports last summer, actually. The, uh, I believe it was a photographer. I'm not sure if he was also a writer for, I think for the, one of the Milwaukee newspapers was on board the ship, or he was also connected to the museum, I think, or the, for sure the museum has the photos, ownership of the photos. And that person took hundreds of photos of, of them going all around Lake Michigan. And luckily he caught sport here. And this was July, 1926. And he says, sport, ship's dog sport on the hyacinth at White River. Now White River is just um, about halfway up. It's um, so south of um, Ludington. So here they are, there's kind of the gangplank and it's hard to see, but I did take this picture. So the animal folks could see the size of his paws. Can you see that one paw? That, his, that one paw is pretty big. And we do know this. This actually, this photo was 68 photos after that previous photo. So probably the next day or the ninth. We know on July 19th, sport died. And that was in the log book that I mentioned that I did, all I saw was what they were loading, what the weather was, nothing personal at all. But on July 19th, 1926, there they uh, recorded, sport died about 12 noon on the 19th. Then turn the page in the log book and July 20th, they record at 1255, we went two miles off of Ludington. They were in Ludington when he died and they buried him at sea. Again, only probably because that um, reporter photographer was there do we have this photo. Now, this photo uh, 
just about got me crying because if you look carefully, sport is, is all set there to be buried at sea. Now, when I found this and then the book came out, I was visiting Ludington, did some programs there and talking to the lighthouse folks there. And Ludington as a city did not know, know that sport was buried two miles off their shoreline. And now that allowed, oh, here's the crew on that same day about 25 of them. That allowed us um, two years ago, right? That was right when the book came out in 2019. The Coast Guard, the lighthouse folks in Ludington told the Coast Guard, which is right next to them, about sport because the lighthouse service became or merged into the Coast Guard in 1939. So the lighthouse service no longer exists, but the Coast Guard does buoy tending they're out keeping the water safe so they we they had a, le a reef lane for sport um so that was very meaningful to me and to the community that um that sport was being recognized as a part of a crew and here's the example of uh, the type of things the coast guard does they do a lot of search and rescues and uh, cutting through the ice And here's the hyacinth at the end of its life, probably about 1957. It's up in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. So you often what happened with ships, they'd strip them down, um, take parts, and then they would off, often be used in a different way, sometimes as tugboats or har, um, hauling other cargo. It seems like a lot of ships had a, a history beyond their official usage. So here it is. Someone had said, but I haven't figured this out, that they thought at one time that pilot house was taken off and used as a small restaurant. And I, I, I probably should check that one out, huh? <laughs> get a picture of a, a pilot house restaurant in somewhere in Wisconsin, probably long gone, I know. And I wanted to share this too. This, um, this is a United States Lighthouse Service Depot in Detroit. Now I just, um, I have to be honest with you, I have not visited it. I just took this photo off the internet. And what I can find and I is that it's owned by the city of Detroit, but I need to investigate this because somehow I'd heard it was going to be made into a museum, but I need to, I think I need to make a call because um, or search around the internet some more. But this was an example of a, of a depot. And I think that, yeah, you can see there's some water behind there. It gives the address where this is. Well, this is where the officers or you know people would have checked in and they would have had some uh, workshops. That building to the left might have been a workshop where they were fixing lights or uh, storing things that went out on the tenders. So a depot was, uh, as you can see, a beautiful building. The main one was in Staten Island, in New York. And that one is being, is a part of the museum now. And they're trying to, um, get parts of that re, um, redone. But it's um, almost like a national um, museum in Staten Island. So I wanted to share that. If, I, if anyone knows anything about it, I'd sure like to know more about it. And the last slide is another statement by Captain Maynard. I'm certain that he had more friends, or should I say acquaintances, around the shores of Lake Michigan than any man on ship today. Again, it's a recognition that Captain Maynard took the time and you, to write this about sport just a couple weeks after he passed away. And Captain Maynard sent this to the Lighthouse Service Bulletin in Washington, DC, and they published it in, in sub, their September issue. But again, if Captain Maynard, just one person, if he had not written some of those quotes, I don't think I could have written the book because uh, it helped me get a sense that sport was well-loved and he was a crewmate on the, on the ship. And let's see. Oh, one, this is fun too. This is just an example of, of me going out and about and seeing kids, the on the left, I do a uh, science experiment where we, they measured uh, the depth of water to be thinking about 
water hazards that are under the surface of the water, sandbars, rocks. And the boy that's hugging my big sport, that's in Muskegon. And I'm sorry, I can't, I forgot the name. Of, I guess I could look closer. And that's an example of a ship that's coming into Muskegon. And I know a lot come up um, through Detroit and up through Huron and up through St. Mary's up to Superior. So I know there are a lot of people that are experts on ships. I'm not an expert on ship, but it just shows that um, the Great Lakes continue to be uh, filled with boats, recreational and uh, commercial. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Pamela. That was really interesting. Okay. Um, we, I did have one comment in the chat. It said, okay. what a great program. The okay. historical information added a lot. The art is fantastic. I want to read the book. Um, Lastly, was that a sport bow, so a stuffed animal at the base of the buoy lens? I think when one of the images did go by, I thought, is that a little tiny sport bow or sport? Oh, yeah. oh, I meant to bring him up from my, I have some, I have one. Oh, I have one that I carry did around. you have him posed yeah. in front of the buoy lens or? Yeah, there were, actually I have a big three foot one. I left him up at the school where I was today. I'm going to be back at a school tomorrow. So I traveled oh. with a big sport and the kids love to hug him. And yes, um, that, not, yes, the book is a book that can be purchased, but also, um, Oh, I love to make jokes about sport. Uh, and this is, I think this is just fun for anyone to think about if you have an interest in writing a book. The publisher might ask you ideas and they ask me um, PR type questions. And of course I was able to talk about Michigan because they're in Wisconsin. That was important to me that I tell them about Ludington or whatever lighthouses. I talked, told them all about, gave them information about lighthouses in Michigan and Michigan has the most lighthouses. So then there was other questions and one just for fun and said, do you have any other ideas? And I said, well, what about a stuffed or they're called plush. <laughs> what about a stuffed uh, sport? Just, I was just having fun, right? Well, they took me up on the idea, just lowly me as a first time mm -hmm. author. And yes, we have, they, once Renee made the illustrations, drew the illustrations, then they had someone design that sport, like, you know, the way he looks, brown and black. And um, yes, that can be purchased from um, the press in Madison, Wisconsin, from the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. They sell it on their website. Then um, when I go out and about, I have a little stock and then I, I get them to the lighthouses or the lighthouses can order them or gift shops can order them because uh, folks uh, like that idea of a book and the plush. Oh, and yeah. I have, if I like, could I share something? And um, it just shows how, this is an example how the book has been so much fun because I've talked to so many people and I'll talk to people and they'll, they'll have a story and I'll say, you can write your story. Yeah, anybody can or write it down for your family. But um, just a, a few weeks ago, um, I had a first in-person meeting at a library and with children and a little guy walked in and he had a little small, he had a small sport. And I could see that sport had just like been worn to death. He'd been, he, he'd had, probably had, the mom said they got it, I don't know, last fall, but this little guy had been sleeping with it for the last year or so. And I, it brought tears to my eyes, just seeing a little kid. And then they brought their book. And that's what literacy and reading is all about. It's connecting with people. So authors, whoever they are, Sometimes you don't know who's reading your book. You don't know the effect, but when you see it, it's really heartwarming. And that's what, that's what life is. That's what being in this world is, is connecting with people. So I'm glad that the book's connected with people and makes me happy. I, I had a question. Um, I'll see if anyone else does, but you mentioned the National Archives and I think the Milwaukee Museum. Right. Um, so what was the process? You heard that there was a dog on a ship and thought, I'm going to do a book about it because you said you are a right. first time Yeah, that's true. So I kind of skimmed, a, yeah, like, I skimmed over book. that at the beginning, didn't I? I saw just a few paragraphs written about him in a couple of lighthouse, general lighthouse books. And I thank those people too. I mean, 
I tried to contact some of those folks that, that are experts on lighthouses. And they put it in their book just as a nice little curiosity story about a dog living on a lighthouse tender. And I felt it needed to be pulled out and written into a children's book. So mm -hmm. then using that concept and then finding Captain Maynard's one page article that he wrote when sport died and then finding out from people at the um, Milwaukee Public Museum, there's a, a curator there who knows quite a bit about ships. He wants to write a book about uh, for adults about the hyacinth. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, he he there's so much that could be written about. That would be a big project. And then it was you can find out that the log books were at the National Archives in Washington, and that was just a fun excuse to go to the National Archives. I'd always wanted to go there. And um, you, there's just a process. I'm, I'm not sure it doesn't matter right now if they're open or not, but anyone in the future, um, I'm forgetting how I did it. I think I applied in advance. You get a name tag. There's a whole security. You go into a room where you put your purse, you, so many different things that you can take. And I think they gave you like a little tote bag you know, they can see what you were taking. And they had very helpful staff. And then in advance, I kind of knew what I wanted. I was able to look some of that up online, the actual items that I wanted. And then it was like a call slip where they would go and bring it to you. And then the fun part was you'd sat at a beautiful desk, beautiful wooden desk in uh, that historic building, the National Archives. And again, I was just a, I'm just a nobody. Anybody could do it. You didn't have to... Uh, of course, you don't have this free. It's just part of our um, great our library taxes, system yeah. from federal all the way down to public libraries and school libraries that that are so necessary and allow anyone to do research. I also yeah. use the Library of Michigan. I went to, actually that was my first visit to the Library of Michigan in Lansing. I always wanted to go there. Perfect excuse and um, wonderful help there. And I would recommend that to anyone if you have an interest. A lot of their collection is you can see the their of course their card catalog their on, their catalog online but then um, some of that some of the items do not circulate through the mill the michigan um, interlibrary loan system so it's just fun to go to a, an institution and, and get a feel for the people that are supporting the historical research how long did that research take you was it like a year-long project or yeah, I didn't work steady at it. I, I kept it doing other things. Um, I get, again, I go off, you know, I get going on like the passenger ships or I get going on dogs. <laughs> I kind of oh. go around. I, I realized it was going to be a, a little bit of learning about a number of things. And then I changed it around. Uh, you know, I so changed you got to learn enough. a lot more than yeah. is probably in the, in the book. You right. Know, yeah. Had to decide yeah. What was the most yeah. important to include. Right, so I, again, I'll, I'm repeating, but I'm an example that if someone has an interest, you don't have to be an expert to start off. You can kind of find your own path or find out what's important and what you think might, the folks might like. And that's what I felt that I was writing it for, uh, initially the children of, of the Great Lakes area. I also wrote it, that sounds funny to say it, but it's the truth. As I wrote it, worked on it, hoping that it would get published, because I didn't know if it would get published, if it got published, that it would be sold at lighthouses and historical sites, and that they would benefit from it. And that's what's happened. And I have to admit that that has just been a thrill that sport is helping historical preservation. That's a full circle thing. Yep. Yeah, that, that's great. Well, there, are there any other questions for Pamela this evening? Got a few, few more people here. Okay. okay, I'm not seeing anything pop up. So I think we'll conclude and I'll stop recording. This program has been recorded. If anyone uh, watching knows someone else who wanted to see it but maybe couldn't make it this evening it will be it usually takes a couple of days and then it shows up on the library's youtube channel so it it will be on there and i want to thank you very much for for coming and telling us all about sport 
and about the Great Lakes, the boats that were on their ships, I should say, um, and the lighthouses. So yeah, there is a there's a lot there, and I could see okay. that it would really a, a child could go many different ways from not just a cute dog, but that right there is good enough for me. But <laughs> but yeah, I could go go many different ways of, in being interested in this book. So I hope you'll buy a copy or check it out from the library somehow um, read about sport. But thank you so much, Pamela. Well, thanks, Kate. And I hope to get to your library soon or sometime oh, in the future. Oh, please do, hey, please do. Come up on the second floor and say hi. Okay, I will. Okay. Yeah, best. Right. thanks everyone. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome.